Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk. Um, uh, I will be talking to you about how I built my first Lisp compiler. Uh, the subtitle is Lessons Learned Building uh, Magic, and the sort of emphasis there is on like lessons learned. Um, my name is Ramsey Nasser, as, as Dylan said. Uh, these are the various places I live on the internet. Um, I am an artist and educator uh, and a, a software engineer, um, uh, currently based in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, and so I want to talk to you about uh, this Lisp compiler that I built over the course of five years. Uh, and it's called MAGIC, which is short for the Morgan and Grand Iron Closure Compiler. Uh, it's one of my, my proudest achievements in uh, uh, compiler branding. So MAGIC is a, uh, a closure compiler. So it takes as input closure source, uh, but it is itself written in closure. Um, and it targets the common language runtime, which is the, uh, the virtual machine that C-sharp runs on. Um, MAGIC was built uh, sort of as a side project of a bigger project called Arcadia, which is a project to integrate closure into the industry standard game engine called Unity. Um, there already is a closure compiler for the common language runtime. Um, it's called closure CLR. Uh, so and magic is sort of an unofficial compiler that sort of shares that same target. Uh, its main goals were uh, to bring closure to restrictive platforms. There are certain uh, platforms that are interesting for game developers, uh, like the iPhone and uh, consoles, like the PlayStation and, and the Xbox, uh, that don't support um, basically eval, like runtime modifiable code. So the compiler itself kind of needs to be aware of that, um, as well as to like land uh, uh, performance and, and bug fixes. Uh, so those are the main goals of, of Magic as a project. Um, it's been, its status is that it's finished, uh, you know, after five years, it's passing all the closure test suite. Uh, it is bootstrapped, so it can compile itself, which is the, the fun list trick that you can do. Um, and uh, it's, it's been used in like an open source context in, in, a, in a few places. And it's being evaluated for use uh, by a game development studio, which is, which is uh, very exciting. Uh, so the Morgan and Grand Iron Closure Compiler, uh, Morgan and Grand is the name of the cross streets in Brooklyn of the building I was in when I started work on it. And this was the site of the Kitchen Table Coder Studio, which is a hotspot for like closure devs for a while. Uh, the studio no longer exists, unfortunately. Uh, five years in New York City real estate time is, you know, an, an, is an entire epoch. So everything has changed. But this is the building, and that's that's the cross street. Uh, so the structure of the talk uh, that um, I'm I'm sort of I'm, I'm going for is I want to give you all a little bit of background on the compiler itself, just so that everything sort of makes sense. Um, and then I want to uh, get into three categories of concrete experiences that I had sort of looking looking back over the last five years. Um, and uh, I, I want to point out similarities that I found in my work on Magic in other compilers, in much more you know competent, much more robust uh, 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 compilers. And so sort there's of like the, the rhymes and the rhythms that I that I found between the work that I was doing and the work that that, that I, I saw others doing. Um, I want to talk about what worked for me, uh, what I would do differently going into another compiler, and answers to this question of why compilers are so complex. Um, which is something that had been on my mind, I think, coming into Magic about five years ago. It wasn't clear to me why the internals of every compiler I'd ever seen was just a sprawling, unreadable mess. Uh, and I feel like five years later, I have a better sense of why compilers are so complex. A lot of that complexity is irreducible, unfortunately. Um, so some background. Um, building your first Lisp compiler is kind of an undergraduate project if you have a focus in compiler construction. Um, that was not my focus in undergrad. Uh, I studied computer science, but my focus was in graphics. Uh, so this is what working on a compiler felt like most of the time. It's like every now and then I'd get something to work and I'd feel like I was sort of, you know, I held in my palm the very Lambda cube. Um, but most of the time I just felt like I had my head stuck in a jar. Uh, so magic is sort of a, a representation of me learning compiler construction by doing compiler construction. Um, a lot, some of the insights here will be very obvious for people who have done compiler stuff before. Um, so I'm not claiming that there's any sort of, you know, ground being broken in this talk. Uh, but it, it, I, the hope is that it'll be interesting to people who don't have a background in compiler theory uh, and might be getting into it the way I was five years ago. So Magic is mostly a solo project. Um, I, like all the text files that are in the repository, I basically wrote them all. But um, 
could not exist in any meaningful way without an entire community of people um, that had sort of guided me and supported me while I was working on it. Uh, these are four uh, uh, people that I want to call out specifically and counterclockwise from the top left are David Miller, who's the original author and maintainer of the Closure CLR uh, uh, implementation. Um, this is the official Closure implementation on, on the C-sharp runtime. Magic still uses his data structure implementations and a patched version of his runtime. So his work very much in a, in a very concrete way continues to power uh, uh, the, the compiler that I built. Uh, Tim's Gardner, longtime friend, uh, collaborator, a business partner for, for a number of years. Uh, sort of going back and forth with Tim's on like uh, uh, language theory and like the best ways to sort of do things was absolutely instrumental in, in getting magic finished. Uh, Tim's also invited me to the studio um, and introduced me to Lisp and Closure. So he sort of like set me off on this path. Uh, and he's one of my, my closest friends. So, um, you know, I, none of this exists without him. Um, Kovas uh, Baguda in the lower right was at the Kitchen Table Coder Studio while I was there. Uh, and he was building a shader compiler in Closure called Gamma. And watching him work on Gamma was, was super generative and, and, and very formative. And um, uh, I basically cribbed a lot of his work uh, for, for Magic's architecture. And then finally, David Nolan of, of uh, quite wide, I think, Closure fame, uh, founded the studio, the Kitchen Table Coder Studio that I was at. Um, and he was there while I was there working on Closure Script. So, so watching him build this very robust production grade compiler was also extremely, extremely formative. Uh, so the whole studio was kind of like an immersion therapy in, of like Lisp compiler design. And I'm very, very grateful to have, to have had that experience. So Magic took five years. Um, this is kind of just from the commits, what that actually means. Uh, the first commits happen around 2015. Um, a bunch of work gets done around 2017. And by early 2018, uh, Magic is sort of usable as a library. So by 2018, Magic could compile a pretty big subset of Clojure. Um, and, but it's not a standalone compiler. It's a Clojure library where you could sort of feed it an S expression and you get back uh, just a, a function basically that you can run. Um, so I, it got put down around then uh, just because of life and other things and other commitments. And I kind of made peace with the fact that maybe it's just a compiler library and I learned a bunch of stuff and I'm like ready to move on to other things. Um, but I actually, uh, we had the great fortune of um, getting to know uh, a, a software, a, a game development studio and uh, they're based in Singapore called Flybot. Um, and we've had a, 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 they use Clojure on the back end and we've been sort of in talks, trying to figure out ways to use Clojure on the front end uh, for the, the games that they make on mobile devices. Uh, and they actually funded the last leg of research, which are the commits that you see in, in, in 2020. So. Uh, that would not have happened without their support, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. So magic is the subject of the, this is the subject I've spoken about most at closure conferences and functional programming conferences over the, the you know, half decade that I've been working on it. Um, so there's five plus hours of me waving my hands on the internet talking about this compiler. Um, and those talks get into much more detail on like a lot of the compiler construction uh, theory. Um, more detail than I have time to get into uh, in, in this talk. So if any of this is interesting, uh, they're all on YouTube. Just look up my name and like Magic Compiler um, and, and uh, there's some, some deep dives there. Um, this talk is gonna focus more on just the like some really specific lessons that, that I feel I learned uh, uh, looking back. So this is sort of what, this is the last bit of background I think uh, that the talk requires to make sense. This is kind of the architecture, the 10,000 foot view of the architecture of the compiler. Uh, it is a functional compiler. Um, it is a, a set of phases that um, move immutable data in between them. Uh, so uh, we use the standard closure reader, which takes you know, strings um, and gives us S expressions. Uh, the S expressions are passed to an untyped analyzer, which does symbolic transformations, uh, produces a, a, a syntax tree. Um, the typed analyzer takes that syntax tree and does type inference on it. Um, Clojure is a dynamically typed language, but Magic uses as much type information as it, could, as it can possibly get to optimize the bytecode that it, that it generates. So the, the semantics don't really change. That's, there's a sort of asterisk there. Uh, but for the most part, we, have a, we dedicate a lot of work to making sure we have good type information to generate fast bytecode. Um, 
the syntax tree is passed to a uh, something that I call a compiler. A, a code gen is probably a better name for this phase. You know, now that uh, looking back, but the job of the compiler is to take the syntax tree and produce a, a symbolic bytecode, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. And then the emitter takes a symbolic bytecode and actually writes runnable code to a memory or to disk. So that's sort of magic in a nutshell. All right, so what, what worked? Um, a couple of things uh, sort of looking back, I think were really effective in helping me get magic finished. And the first sort of accidentally that I think worked was building the compiler backwards. Um, so this is the same sort of chart of the compiler architecture, but color coded just to make sort of the colors aren't meaningful. They just sort of like might help, uh, you know, uh, uh, coordinate between these, these two, these two flows um, and tagged with the dates where these different phases got started. Uh, so on the left is the actual data flow of the compiler. And on the right is the phases sorted by first commit. And you can see it's almost exactly backwards. Right. The first thing I did was the emitter. The first thing I did was figure out how to generate bytecode. And then now that I had a thing that could generate bytecode, I started working on the thing to talk to that thing to tell it what bytecode to generate. And then I started, you know, years later getting worried about um, uh, the analysis. And it really wasn't until earlier this year that, that like strong, well reasoned sort of typed analysis even uh, got started. Um, I don't know that I would advocate building a compiler this way, uh, but it worked because the, the compiler was interesting at every step of the way uh, for me as a developer, right? And it's sort of, it, from the perspective of like managing interest, this was really, really sort of an accidentally effective approach. Uh, it makes me think of this diagram, which is, there are versions of this that are famous in the world of uh, user experience design. The idea is that um, when you're building a prototype, uh, you, you're prototyping up towards some kind of like finished uh, product. You actually want I, every prototype to be individually interesting. So you don't want to, if you're building a car, you're, you don't want your first prototype to be a wheel because like no one cares about just a wheel. You maybe want it to be a skateboard, right? And then the next one is a bicycle and the next one is a motorcycle. Um, I would probably stop at the motorcycle if I had a choice on this chart. But, um, so from the perspective of just managing interest, uh, I think building it backwards was really, really effective for me. Um, and part of what helped with that was putting in the time to build an introspective workflow. Um, so from very early on, I actually built a, a tool that would read uh, assembly files that I was building to disk and host, you know, like on, on my local machine, host uh, like HTML disassembly of, that, of the binaries. So I, I had a workflow that I used for the five years that I worked on Magic where in my closure REPL, I would compile files to disk and then my introspection tool, uh, which I called Illness, would uh, look at the files, uh, look at the compiled files and then update this like HTML view of the disassembled code. Um, and it could disassemble to C sharp or to pretty printed bytecode. So I, I was never really in the dark about, you know, what is my compiler doing? What is the bytecode generating? What does it look like? How does it compare to C sharp? I basically always had like a scope into the machinery of the compiler. And that kept it, I mean, it's like great for debugging, but it also, because I started with the emitter and it, so I always had bytecode to look at, it just meant that I always had something interesting to sort of like look, look at and think about. Um, Illness, this tool is based on a tool called SharpLab. If you go to sharplab.io, there's this online C sharp disassembler, which is absolutely incredible. Um, this is kind of how I learned uh, uh, a big part of like, you know, how to write, you know, the, the, the more clever parts of a compiler. I would just kind of see what C sharp did and just copy the bytecode over into magic. And that just totally worked as a strategy. Um, if you're not interested in C sharp, there's an uh, godbolt.org hosts a disassembler for Rust, C++, and a whole smattering of other languages. Um, and I mean, part of what's interesting about compilers to me is the like the silly game of like, you know, seeing some code turn into some other code. Like, like that's kind of the whole, that's the whole puzzle, right? And that's like, if you're interested in that, these online tools are really, really wonderful for it. And, you know, building a tool for myself that did that uh, was super, super effective for debugging and to manage and, and to just to keep the process interesting at every step of the way. So um, I'd mentioned symbolic bytecode um, earlier on, uh, and it was in the sort of the, the, the data flow of, of the compiler. 
And this is a strategy that I, I took um, sort of watching other people, the way that other people use closure to solve difficult problems. Um, and the idea behind symbolic bytecode is to create an immutable data representation of the bytecode that you're generating. Um, and if you can do that, then the, 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 the project of you know, emitting bytecode becomes regular functional programming. So an example of that uh, is the way uh, some of the constants are loaded in magic. So this is taken directly from magic. Um, all of the calls highlighted in green prefixed with IL, um, this is from the symbolic bytecode library that, that, uh, that I built. And it's basically, there's a mechanical, there's a one-to-one -one mapping of these um, forms to actual runnable uh, CLR bytecode. But these functions all return closure, immutable closure data that you could sort of store and move around that are completely inert, uh, free of context, um, and, and very easy to just do regular closure functional programming on. Um, so you see like to load a string constant, it's uh, LDSTR, that's the opcode that we use. Uh, to load a big decimal, which is something that is specific to closure, we see it's actually two instructions. We load the string representation of the big decimal number, uh, and then we call the parse method. So that's what ends up in, in the, the actual uh, method bytecode. Um, so by representing the bytecode as functional data, um, it, it sort of allowed me to reason about it at a very granular level, just, just as the way you would reason about any other functional data. Um, so the library is called MAGE, which stands for the Morgan and Grand Emitter, which is to, just to keep the branding consistent with the rest of the compiler. Um, and it provides a representation of the full um, metadata and instruction set on the CLR. So everything down from the individual bytecodes inside of the methods that will eventually run to the methods that contain them, to the types that contain the methods and the modules and the assemblies and so on. Um, so this um, basically saved my butt a bunch of times. Uh, in the same way that just functional programming is a good idea, uh, it definitely applies when you're dealing with something as like weird and finicky as bytecode. So um, not, I'm not alone in this observation. Um, I'm certainly, it's not a novel one. Um, this is a snippet from the f -sharp compiler, which is also a, a functional compiler and that maintains its own functional representation of the uh, target bytecode. Uh, so f -sharp is an ML style statically typed language uh, so for them, uh, their representation of bytecode is this tagged union, this sum type with, with different cases. But it's the same idea. It, they're, you, they're just turning code generation into just regular functional programming. Uh, and, and that's a strategy that I would definitely repeat in any future compilers that I work on. So that's, that's the stuff that worked. Uh, perhaps more interesting is the things that I would do differently. And these are the lessons that were like, um, Hard, hard, like learned hard. Um, I would, the, 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 probably the main thing I would do differently is rethink the analyzer, which is, as you saw in the history, kind of the last thing that happened. Um, and I would sort of approach analysis from the perspective of uh, lowering. And um, I'll give you an example of what I mean, and then we can look at some compilers that do it in a way that I think is, is a little bit better. Um, so here's, here's a funny like, but valid expression in closure. So uh, it's a try expression with no catch and no finally. Semantically, this should exactly be a do, right? There's, it's kind of a weird thing to write. Maybe it came out of a macro. Maybe you had a catch and you deleted it. Um, it should just turn into a do. So uh, a good way to, to model that is a pass that goes over you know, the input code and if, it, if you encounter a try expression with no catch or finally, you just literally turn it into a do. So the downstream, the machinery that exists to handle do will pick that do up. And the machinery built to handle try knows that you'll have at least a catch or a finally. Uh, and the bytecode that you generate for a try expression is quite complex. So you don't want to do it if you don't have to. Magic does not do that. Uh, the try expressions just kind of flow through the compiler. And it's only at the very last step when we're generating bytecode that we do the check. So this is the uh, compiler for, the, for try expressions. So this is basically the thing that generates the bytecode for try. The first thing that it does is it checks to see if the uh, uh, catches, which would be a sequence, is empty, uh, or if final, the final expression is nil. And if it is, it recursively just compiles the body. 
So this is like a, a semantic decision being made at the level of the bytecode generation. And it's not the end of the world, this like works, but the code generator, that like last step, it, the, the, or the, the one that I called the compiler in the, in the flow is doing so much semantic work that it really shouldn't be doing. And if I were to approach this differently, I would move as many semantic decisions up the pipeline as possible into the analyzer uh, so that the compiler itself would be like considerably simpler. Um, so the word lowering is something that I've seen in other compilers and I actually like it a lot. Um, the idea is that your, uh, your, your um, compiler pipeline uh, is basically a series of transformations that lower one representation into, into another. And so like the word lower is directed, right? So the source that you're uh, compiling is this, the highest level thing. And you're basically transforming it into a sequence of intermediate representations, each of which resembles the target a little bit more. So at every representation, you like lose a feature of the higher level representation. So you're like lowering it down into bytecode or machine code. Um, on the left is a screenshot from the wiki for ML ton, which is an ML compiler. And they have nine different uh, passes and nine different intermediate representations, uh, starting with source and ending with machine code. And each one of these passes just does, it just sort of moves it a little bit along. Um, so that each, it's, you know, nine passes is a lot of passes, but each pass is quite focused and, and, and simpler to reason about. On the right is a screenshot from a blog post uh, about the Rust compiler adding an intermediate representation, the uh, MIR representation, to make the transition from HIR, the uh, high level intermediate representation, to LLVMIR, which is effectively uh, machine code. That transition they found to be like very steep and, and very difficult to reason about. So they broke it up with an extra lowering step. Uh, magic kind of looks like what the today column in, in the Rust example looks like. Uh, and and that, that just means that there's parts of the system that are sort of have more than one concern and they're less focused than they should be. So I'd mentioned that building backwards really worked for me. Um, uh, uh, something I would want to repeat is a, a way to keep the compiler interesting at every step of the way. Because uh, if you're doing it, you know, if it's something that's going to take multiple years and it's like only gets interesting in the fourth year, I don't have the discipline to keep going, right? I just sort of like get bored and move on. Um, but I think there's a better way to do it than building the compiler backwards. Um, there's a super interesting paper by uh, a researcher named uh, Abdelaziz Ghulum. Uh, and it's sort of like an orthogonal approach to what I did in Magic. So in Magic, I sort of implemented the phases separately and, and backwards. You could think of that as like a vertical approach maybe. And what Ghulum uh, advocates is a sort of like horizontal approach, where the first thing you do is you build all the phases. You go from source to machine code but the language is just integers. And then the next step, it's now the language is integers or floats. And then the next step, it's integers, floats, and maybe some primitive operations. And he builds up a scheme that way in this paper. Super, super, super interesting. Um, but I think that this approach gives you like a higher level view on the whole compiler, as opposed to, uh, I felt a little compartmentalized in each individual uh, uh, phase. Um, so uh, definitely go read this paper. It's, it's a really, really easy read. Uh, and it's kind of wild how fast he, he goes from integers to tail recursion. Um, this gets a, maybe a little bit into the weeds, um, but uh, something I, I, I didn't really take seriously enough, the like, um, importance of doing your own bookkeeping. Um, and I relied a lot on like external APIs. Um, and pre-existing APIs in, in the hope that I would keep things simple by not building my own infrastructure. But this ended up kind of uh, biting me in, in the butt. Um, so as a, as a really simple example of something that just was uh, you know, much more widespread than this, but um, here's a function from magic. Um, so uh, zero ARD, you give it a method, um, it calls get parameters on the method, it counts them, and if it returns true, if they're zero and false, if they're not, right? This comes up all over the place. Uh, super, super useful, and it's fine. This is correct for the most part. Except if the method you're passing it is a method builder, which is a method that is actively being constructed. So if, a, if the method had already been compiled, that function works fine. If the method, if you, for whatever reason, wanted to check the number of parameters or check the 
zero ness of, of method that you're currently building, it will throw an exception. I couldn't tell you why. There is, probably isn't a great reason. This is a, this is a, the bytecode APIs in C Sharp are from the 90s um, or the early 2000s, and this is a, a dumb quirk as far as I can tell. Um, this one is not a big deal, right? Um, but this is an instance of a much wider class of headaches. Um, all kinds of weird edge cases of like, oh, you actually can't ask this question about this type in this context that happens once in your compiler in five years. Um, so a lot of sort of pain went into sort of mitigating the, 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 the quirks of the API that, that I was interacting with. Um, and I think if I were to do it again, I would just build a layer in between what the compiler was doing and the APIs that it was talking to. Um, so all the mitigation could live in one place. This is like general good software engineering device, but I definitely missed it while I was building magic. All right, so um, that's, and that segues into my key takeaway of like a source of complexity in, in compilers. So um, compilers, there's a kind of intrinsic irreducible complexity to compiler construction. Like languages are weird. Um, I, I find languages really interesting because you're trying to reconcile what humans think they want and the sort of like ambiguity of that desire, right? With like the object, like the, the sort of formal requirements of a machine. So that aside, there's this whole other source of complexity that I hadn't even considered before going into magic, which is the fact that you're actually dealing with a lot of things that you just don't control and can't account for. Um, so in the case of something like magic, we were targeting an existing virtual machine and we had to sort of deal with all of its requirements. Um, here's an example. So in closure, try is an expression. Uh, you can use it wherever you want, right? You could stick a try in the middle of an addition and this is perfectly valid closure. Uh, however, a careful reading of the ECMA specification, which uh, is definitely something that I did before starting the compiler, will show you that in uh, you know, partition one, section 12.4.2.8.1, um, the, there's the paragraph, uh, entry to protected blocks can be accomplished by fall through at which time the evaluation stack shall be empty which means that in order to enter a try region at the bytecode level, the evaluation stack has to be guaranteed to be empty. Um, this is not a problem in C-sharp because try is a statement in C-sharp, so there couldn't be anything on the evaluation stack when you enter a try, but try is an expression in closure, so how do you do it, right? Um, the, first, the first transformation that I did, I basically just put all the tries into a function and just called that function. Uh, this was messy and introduced its own complexities. The current implementation will actually turn any expression containing a try into a let binding, bind all the values, and then uh, you know, if it's, invoca if it's in invocation, the invocation then becomes the body of the let. Um, so this is fine and this works, and I think F-sharp does something similar, but um, I, I, this, is a, a source, this is a complex part of the compiler that I can't get rid of. And it's not because of anything that I wanted. It's just the, like, the VM that I'm targeting is, has these needs that I have to meet, uh, and, I, and I don't control it. Similar to that, um, in, especially in the case of Magic, well, I also didn't control the source language. Um, and I made the joke on social media that you know, I didn't know that when you compile a language, you had to compile the whole thing. Um, but uh, that turns out to be the case. <laughs> so uh, as, as an example of that, um, if you're a Clojure developer, think for a moment, how many different ways are there to, de to define a type in Clojure? From a compiler perspective, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, is that seven, am I getting that right? Seven different ways, or, or seven, seven different kinds of type definitions that the compiler needs to know about. These don't all sort of compile down to the same thing. They're all different enough that the compiler needs special code to deal with them. Um, and I, I have def record and def type up here, although as a closure programmer, my understanding of def record is that it just expanded into def type because it's a macro. That's not actually totally true. The def type compiler is full of special cases for def record. Um, this is a result of like time right? Closure, like adding features over time and the sort of idea about type definition evolving over time. Um, there are these little inconsistencies where like in proxy, 
the this uh, reference is a um, is is just an implicit binding. Like this is a magical keyword called this that you can use. But in Rayify, it's a it's a parameter that you pass. So these are different code paths of the compiler. Um, and if I could control my source language, I would just not do this, right? And make the problem disappear. Uh, but control your source language, then you know you kind of can't do that. Um, and and the last thing, so beyond the source and the target, uh, and being able to control them, there's also just this wider world of, of tooling that you might care about. Um, and for us, run, that kind of came down to running on the iPhone. And to run uh, 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 code on an iPhone in this, the game engine that we target, the bytecode has to go through a, a post process or, or a, um, a transpiler called IL2CPP that converts your C sharp bytecode into C++ that it then compiles to run natively on, on a phone. It's a miracle to me that any of that works as well as it does. Magic does survive that transformation, which is wild. Um, but we hit this funny wall where uh, the IL2 CPG was initially choking on our uh, throw expressions. And um, we, so the, the, what it comes down to is the question of baz here, right? In the, in the expression on top. Do you emit that invocation? Um, we know, statically, we know that baz will never be called, right? Because there's a throw right before it and we effectively return from that method and we, and we, we blow the stack. Um, C sharp will not emit baz. Every compiler that I've seen will actually skip anything that comes after a, a throw expression. I didn't do that initially because it seemed like an optimization um, and it's not wrong. And I feel like it's important to stress on the record that like we weren't wrong. Like I read the spec and it's like not incorrect to have bytecode after a throw expression. Uh, it's okay in the spec, it passes the verifier, C sharp can consume it, it's all invocable. But IL2CPP made the assumption that there would be no bytecode after a throw expression. And for whatever reason, it caused it to crash. So arguably that's a bug in IL2CPP, right? We could sort of make the formal argument that we did the right thing and then I did the right thing. But at the end of the day, when you have a deadline and you have features that you're trying to deliver, that, that becomes your reality. So magic actually has a pass to clean up expressions after throw. And it's not simple, right? That's a source of complexity that we now have to manage because of this like tool that we, that we care about. Um, so the sort of sources of complexity that come from like the fact that your language is a thing in the world and it's touching other things that you don't control and can't really, really sort of suit to your own needs. Um, I think this is why languages historically have, um, you know, a, a lot of languages will be the design of the language and the compiler and the runtime will all happen at the same time to maximize what it is that you control. Um, but, you know, there are other trade-offs with, with, with that approach for sure. Oops. So uh, to wrap up, I mean, I don't know, this like image of compiler development as a dragon poking out of a screen is the funniest thing in the world to me. Um, and uh, coming into compiler dev, I felt like it, it can't possibly be dragon level hard. And five years later, I mean, I wouldn't say it's not a dragon. It's definitely a dragon. It's like some of the hardest code I've had to write in my entire life, but it's a friendly dragon. You know, and it's a dragon you can get to know and like be friends with and like and, and have fun with. Um, so this is my like proposed re re revision of, of the standard compilers textbook. <laughs> uh, that's everything I have. That's awesome stuff, Ramsey. Thank you so much. Uh, does anybody have any questions on any of that? There's uh, nothing in the session Q and A on Hoover. So if you do have a question, you can drop it in the chat, or you can just unmute yourselves and ask the question. Uh, apparently, we've we've just enabled that feature as well now. So. <laughs> no, I, I personally found that really really interesting, particularly so. Uh, so it's a. The, the tool chain there, you're using Clojure to emit IL bytecode directly that then runs against the CLR. Yep. So you effectively have the whole thing is completely independent of the entire .NET runtime ecosystem until you end up with a binary that will then run on the, the .NET runtime. But that's actually pretty remarkable. That's <laughs> but, but the whole thing is built on Clojure CLR. Yeah. So, so, so the data structures are all written, it's all in, written in C sharp. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, basically, the, as the last step, the sort of binary shows up. 
and and it's consumable by the runtime. That's fascinating and, and really interesting. So, are there any questions, observations, comments, feedback? I always think if there's if there's no questions at the end, it means you've achieved complete enlightenment. <laughs> we we have got a couple just popped up over in the. Um, the, the, the Q&A, so we got a, uh, Dennis, in most cases, compilers are written in static typed languages. What did Clojure and its dynamism bring to the table that made construction of the compiler easier or more difficult? That's an excellent question. So, and I, I talk about that in a talk I did earlier this year at Clojure North, where I compare my experience building magic to my experience building another compiler, a sort of personal project in F sharp. Um, and there's no, I think, sweeping truth either way. There's definitely trade-offs to, to each approach. Um, I think the dynamism that um, I, I got in Clojure enabled a lot of the sort of REPL-driven workflow is very difficult to replicate, I think, um, in, in uh, very hard static systems. There are versions of it, but it's like not quite as good. Um, the main thing, though, is the fact that the syntax tree um, and really everything in the compiler is just Clojure hash maps. Um, so the, you, you know, instead of a transformation pipeline where you're turning instances of one type into instances of another type and you have this very discrete transformation, um, it's a pipeline of things kind of adding metadata to like a syntax tree and just sort of like sculpting it into the shape that it needs to be by the time it gets to, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh code generation and emission phases. So it's, it became very easy to make like local spot fixes and there's very little ceremony in like, you know, adding a representation. Uh, like I'm not creating new types for, for, or, or anything like that. Um, and um, the one other thing I'll call out for that, which, which I didn't mention in this talk at all, is the fact that the, the dispatch um, that Magic does in order to decide which function to use to turn a particular expression into byte, into byte code is uh, completely dynamic. Uh, it's not a multi-method or anything like that. It's, um, there's basically a hash map of um, expression, like keyword types to like to uh, compiler functions. And any expression can customize the compilation of its sub-expressions. And when you compile, when you combine that with uh, lexical closures, things like let bindings become very, very easy. So a let binding basically says, okay, any local expression that is a sub-expression of me, compile yourself using this code that lexically closes over uh, you know, the local variables that I'm gonna write into memory. And that all happens in one place. Um, and I haven't found a good way to replicate that in the static type language. It kind of needs like good hash maps. Cool. Um, so we got a question from Daniel, the, the closure community in, in New York City, what became of it? <laughs> Well, COVID happened. I mean, that hasn't, that hasn't helped <laughs> in the last year. Um, I, I don't know that it has um, uh, disappeared or, or changed. I mean, the, the meetups are still there. People are still there doing, doing stuff and doing work. Um, so I, I, think maybe, I think maybe Daniel's specifically asking about the place on the... Oh, um, oh, oh KTC. Of, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, New York City rent. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's basically at the uh, um, a building down the street was purchased by I think Livestream. So the the, the studio was in was in Williamsburg. Um, the sequence of events as I remember them is like a building in the neighborhood got bought outright, and then our rent doubled. <laughs> sort of like next like a few months later, uh, and then I, I I left soon after that. And I think the whole studio eventually like, moved on. So I don't know the exact details, but I, I do know that it was starting to get very, very expensive. Cool. And the last question from Luca, is your compiler the one used for developing, developing Unity with Clojure? So the plan, the next steps are to make Magic the default compiler in Arcadia. Uh, that is currently not the case. Um, it's mostly a question of integration and just sort of doing, doing that work. Uh, but it was that was the light at the end of the tunnel for five years was that we would have this compiler that we could control and and you know do our optimizations and our our platform support for.